It's 7.30 here in Europe, so I believe we can start with the first speaker, which is Nathael Haubert Cato. So I invite him to share the screen and start the presentation. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, can you hear me, see my screen? Anything? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm Nathanael Obercato from the Ochonomizu University in Tokyo. Um, and I will present uh, the work I realized with uh, some of my colleagues from uh, the ESPCI in Paris and uh, the University of Tokyo, obviously in Tokyo as well, um, in which we have proposed a microfluidic device to perform uh, the evolution of parasitic species in vitro uh, in a molecular system. So, um, well, the motivation for this work, I hope this is not, okay. The motivation for this work um, was the evolution of parasitism in complex systems. So um, there are examples of this happening whenever you have an autocatalytic system or mechanism present in a, a molecular environment. So one of the most famous example would be Spiegelman's monster. Um, but you have examples using uh, RNA replication. Uh, you have examples uh, in silico where you would perform, you know, evolution of species in the presence of parasites. Even in game theory, you would see that um, having uh, parasite parasitism is actually a good strategy uh, to overcome the system. So we know that we would have parasites uh, appearing, and that they actually can drive uh, the complexity of a system. Um, there are other pictures I could have chosen for parasites in biology, uh, but I usually find them a bit gross. So, you know, uh, I'm not putting them here, but you know, you can look it up as well. Um, so yes, uh, the good thing is that it actually helps push forward a system, a complex system uh, in interesting ways. Um, one of the downside when you're doing it with a molecule, like in molecular system, is that, well, parasites tend to be very, very hard to get rid of. Um, they will overcome your system, and provided that you're using the same kind of environment for your actual experiments, otherwise, uh, well, you will be stuck with them uh, forever. So there are a lot of horror stories in the field of people who are just, you know, enable uh, to get rid of those parasites even year after they stopped doing experiment. So the idea was to have an experimental platform that allows this type of paras parasites to emerge while being safe. Um, so first of all, the kind of system we are interested in here uh, are based on interactions between molecules. So we're interacting at the molecular level. Uh, the reason to do so is that, well, that scale gives you a very large number of entities. Um, sorry, but uh, it's not about it here. And you get parallelism for free. Uh, but in general, uh, you would require precise arrangement uh, of molecules. Like if you're trying to make structures uh, at the nano scale, well, you have to be very careful on what goes where. Um, and what interact with what, or else, well, strange things will happen. But that's good. That's actually what is the point here. So in our case, going at uh, the molecular scale uh, with imprecise reproduction mechanisms, so using enzyme actually gives us this kind of, you know, automated, like built-in mutations that will allow us um, to perform this emergence of structure. Um, so more specifically, if you're interested, we are focusing on something called DNA computing, which is um, one of those approaches working at the molecular scale, where we are specifically using DNA molecules and, well, enzyme working with DNA. Uh, the reason for that is that we can easily program what will interact with what through DNA sequences. So DNA sequence will only interact through complementarity. 
um, and enzyme will recognize specific um, places. Uh, we can go into more details about what uh, programming we're doing uh, with boost molecules. We can generally specify data as a concentration of various species and operation on those data are the chemical reactions that happen between those species. There have been a large variety of approaches using DNA and uh, enzyme or not uh, proposed over the years. We are here, uh, so using something called the Pen DNA Toolbox. So what is the Pen DNA Toolbox and how do we program our system? Um, as I mentioned, so the reaction we have are based on DNA. So we have DNA molecules that are interacting with each other um, through complementarity. So we don't care so much about the actual sequence. Uh, if you are orange, you have a given sequence and you're complementary with this other orange, so you will form a double strand, but you're not complementary with uh, the green, so you don't go here. And then what happens is, maybe it's easier to see uh, at the bottom, or what? I'm not sure. Uh, so you have one species called A that interact with a longer species called A to B. Uh, through complementarity, they actually bind together. Um, so then the first enzyme called uh, polymerase will extend this strand by, uh, tem like by templating the all the green. So we will get the complementary sequence here. So now we have like two long strands. A second enzyme called nicane, uh, nic nicase, like a nicking enzyme, will actually recognize a sequence here and cut the upper strand in the middle. Uh, those strands, like those duplexes are not stable. So you have blue that can just fall off and go back in the system. Green can also fall off and you know, be in the system as B. Um, and then we have another uh, strand called B to A, which does the same thing in reverse. So from one B, you will get A. So that's obviously an autocatalytic cycle. Uh, so the more A you have, the more B you have, the more B you have, the more A you have. Uh, to keep things uh, from exploding, we have a third enzyme called exonuclease that just destroys those A and Bs over time. Uh, so they are degraded over time. The older ones, so the long ones, are actually chemically protected against that um, uh, reaction. So that's why they are stable. And you know, otherwise, uh, yeah, um, overall, we'll just stay in the system and keep the system from uh, you know, disappearing. So they represent the program itself. And based on the definition I gave earlier, those would be uh, the data. So then we can move on to um, localizing the system. So we don't want um, to have everything in a well-mixed spot because if you're in a well-mixed system and you have parasite, parasites appearing, well, they'll just take over and uh, your system is dead. Uh, this is a well-known problem for the pen toolbox, for basic uh, autocatalytic system, uh, in a well-mixed environment. So what we're using is just this kind of very simple uh, microfluidic channel. Um, we are using uh, Cepharos microbeads. So they're actually agarose beads cross-linked with streptavidin. And the template, so the long A to B and B to A strands I was talking about are actually grafted um, to those beads by having a biotin uh, modification so that you have biotin and streptavidin interacting together uh, that attach the long strand to the bead so it doesn't move since the bead doesn't move uh, ever. And instead, what you will have is that A and B, which are free to move in the environment, uh, will react there on the bead to produce their counterpart, and then they will freely diffuse uh, in their environment. And if you have uh, only one type in a given place, you should not have any reaction because uh, it's not a full autocatalytic cycle. Instead, 
you will only see uh, activity where you have both type of beads. So beads with the A to B strands and beads with the B to A strands. Uh, and to have some kind of you know, island environment, what we do is that we have one type of bead in large excess compared to the other one. Um, once we have mixed everything together, we just seal the environment and it never opens again. Uh, otherwise, uh, my colleague will have a heart attack. Um, and yes, so then what you will see is that you have uh, reactions happening. Um, so what you will see is that you have reactions nicely happening uh, near the places where you have both types of leads. So we are monitoring uh, the concentration of DNA, local concentration of DNA through fluorescence. So yeah, more fluorescence means more activity and more DNA. Um, and you know, uh, that was great. That was uh, previous work from uh, my coworkers. Um, but you know, that they were trying just to implement this kind of program and they didn't um, go to the next step, which is, well, what happens if we allow this kind of parasitic species to kind of try to take over uh, in some places and not other and see what kind of behavior will happen. So um, the idea then, well, one hypothesis we had was that uh, those parasitic species would appear through the activity of uh, polymerase. So polymerase is the one producing new strands. So if it makes a mistake, you will include new species inside the environment. And most of the time, nothing should happen because, well, these new species do not, you know, are not compatible with the program. So they would not, well, they should not do anything. And then eventually they would get degraded by exonuclease. But in some cases, you know, with low probability, uh, you have some variants that will just take over and, uh, you know, take over the uh, polymerase nicking um, uh, reaction uh, mechanism and just reproduce a lot more of itself. So uh, we tried three setups. So one where the concentration of polymerase was similar to the previous work, uh, one where we had twice that, and one where we had twice more, like even so four times the original. Um, and yes, so we had the one to 100 uh, bead ratio to keep colonies far apart. And what we could see, especially with the 2% polymerase, uh, which will give more example later, is that, well, first behaves correctly, but then you have like this Armageddon-like system where you have like these large structures where, well, again, uh, fluorescence represents, uh, uh, sorry, I, I didn't explain the scale bar, it was 200 uh, micrometers, um, where you have these very large structures. In this case, it's about 100 nanometer uh, long. That is full of DNA and we don't know what it is. Um, all the background, as you can see, gets you know, a lot more uh, bright due to fluorescence and of, you know, some DNA species present in there. You have even like spots uh, here and there. Um, so yeah, um, my colleagues found that terrifying and they told me when I said, oh, maybe we should just, you know, investigate what it is. And they're like, no, 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 just throw that away. And, uh, you know, <laughs> keep it closed. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we kept it closed. Uh, still, so because we have like a ton of data, we generated a ton of data thanks to these specific islands, we could observe a bunch of uh, different type of behaviors. So the one I just showed was like large structures uh, appearing. We had like sphere-like structures where, uh, you know, there's nothing here, but suddenly there's like a dot. Uh, and some very small, like snow-like structures like this. Uh, what was interesting, so, um, this is all in the paper, the data are also available online. Uh, what is more interesting is probably to watch the videos. Uh, hopefully you can see that. So yeah, um, yeah, I have enough time. So yeah, here's an example. Um, 
one example. So, you know, you have the system going on, I can kind of normally like everything's, and then, you know, like suddenly boom, <laughs> like something uh, just coming over and starting to make these small structures. So that was the type two in the middle. Uh, this is the example of type one, so making two large structures. So at first, you know, everything's going on uh, and around one, uh, okay, you cannot see the timestamp. Ah, if I move over, you cannot see the time. You can see the video right, right? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, around like 1000 something, you have this like very suddenly appearing and uh, growing very really quickly, really quickly taking over. Another example of that type um, was like this, you know, you go to 500 uh, minutes, everything's fine. And then suddenly, you know, like <laughs> you know, this thing coming in and you're like, oh, I don't like it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think this is the uh, last type. So the one where you would have kind of snow appearing. Yes, this kind of thing is happening here kind of taking over the whole thing. And what is really interesting with those is that they disappear over time. So obviously this is a sealed system. So there is limited fuel in the environment. And while the other two type of structure just remain there, uh, eventually those just disappear, which is probably because they are consumed by uh, the exonuclase. So they're pr they probably have like a different type of structure. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So again, we want to keep things sealed so we cannot really um, get further uh, inside about it, but it was interesting. Um, so also what we could see is count how many of each type uh, we got. So for 2% uh, polymers, we got parasites everywhere uh, and a bit of, you know, kind of uh, uh, a bit of everything. For the other types, we only got, for the other concentration of polymers, we only got type two, um, and they appeared much later. So obviously the polymerase has you know, some uh, impact uh, on the appearance of those structures. Uh, I'm not sure if doing the experiment with more fuel for longer would have uh, allowed the uh, other types to appear as well, but yeah, it's something I would be interesting, uh, interested in. Uh, looking for in the future. Um, another thing was that, well, it was very obvious uh, once things started to really like, uh, you know, at some point it's, it's very obvious that there are some parasites in the system, but even way before that, way before uh, you can by eye detect that there is a problem, uh, you could already see in, that there is an increase in the level of background fluorescence. So the black part uh, of the and of the system already starts, you know, bright uh, brightening up. So that tells us that there is some parasitic species that survives inside the environment. So that means that they probably have some ways of deflecting the the exonuclease, or um, that their reproduction rate, at least locally, uh, without any template, is faster than the degradation of the exonuclease. And Incidentally, so of course, as I mentioned, there are some uh, examples that had uh, for the other concentration of polymers that were clearly parasitic, uh, but some other were not obviously parasitic, but still, you know, when we look at the background, we can slightly see a beginning of um, increase, meaning that probably parasite will appear in there uh, eventually. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's all the time I have. So I'm about to stop here. So we showed um, a very basic uh, setup to have a safe environment where you could play around with the evolution of parasitic structures. Um, and their behavior was much more varied than we would have expected at first. Uh, it was also interesting, uh, even though I don't have time to talk much about that, uh, to see the collision of the different fronts. So uh, you have like the front of background fluorescence just moving along. And in some cases you can just see uh, fronts colliding uh, 
you know, so different species of parasites kind of taking over, like fighting uh, in specific places. Um, what was, so because they are coming from different places, we can assume that they're independent. So that's kind of an island model. Uh, and we used a very basic uh, molecular program, but, you know, current literature has much more advanced uh, program that can be implemented in vitro. So we could try that to, you know, kind of give a chance to the legitimate process to just, you know, fight back um, as far as I um, also, because we have these ideas about the background fluorescence and kind of average time of the emergence of parasitic species, it also gives us insight for researchers who want to avoid this behavior. So if you want to implement an actual molecular system without, you know, being taken over by parasite, well, it tells you that, okay, if you have this, uh, well, you can use this platform to try what is the time scale until which you are still safe. Uh, from the emergence of the species, which will make it, you know, uh, less dangerous, well, you know, which will reduce the risk of contamination uh, of your lab. And yes, as I mentioned, all the data, the, all the raw data are available online. Um, use the link. You can actually get the link in the paper as well. Uh, those are raw data, so you would need to get an image like this. You would need uh, a software like uh, ImageJ um, and, you know, kind of uh, adjust the contrast and, you know, it's all black and white otherwise, so you will probably need to change the color map, uh, but that's it. So thank you for uh, your attention and yes, I'll take your questions now. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Nathanael. And so now um, we have uh, some minutes for a discussion because uh, we have uh, seven minutes, so we can um, okay. make questions and uh, deepen a little bit our knowledge about this system. So I first ask the audience whether there are some questions. Actually, there are not many people, okay. but maybe there is a question. Not yet. Okay, so I have uh, some questions. V very interesting uh, um, job. So I am. My, my first question, you know, you show three different patterns. Let's say the large objects, the circle, and the small objects. So, but um, what would be the expectation? I mean, if you don't know anything. Um, so, for example, I I see this for the first time. I believe that. Small structures probably are the first thing that happen, right? If uh, I understood well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, the the second one. The second one are the most frequent. Uh, so uh, is a like yeah. a um, let's say a diffusion, circular diffusion. You mean? Yeah. Kind of, well, kind of like making kind of circular structures that appears no matter what. Like we always get that, um, and. The other ones, so this one, the large structures are the less, the least frequent, and the other one are frequent at high polymerase concentration, uh, but they don't appear at lower concentration. So we have an hypothesis for this one uh, because, as I mentioned, they get degraded, they get destroyed by the exonuclease. So you need enough polymerase, you need enough construction power to fight off uh, the destruction, right? Like if you if you divide by two the uh, production rate, then uh, probably you know the degradation rate is just too high for you to actually make an actual structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but those ones, ah, sorry, uh, those ones the type two, we would assume that some mutation or some modification inside well the, the specific structure of uh, those DNA well the specific sequence of those DNA strands actually prevents the activity of the uh, exonuclease. Like for instance, if they have like secondary structure that would hide uh, their five prime end, which is the one that is uh, where the exonuclease attaches. So that's probably why those would appear no matter what. Um, no. Okay, but do, do you have some hypothesis about, uh, you know, mechanistic, uh... Uh, explanation. So, for at the beginning, these uh, new DNA strands, the parasitic one, are mm, individual. Let's say, 
and then uh, when they accumulate they can start to um, bind together right if i understand well yes. and the and the small structures are actually uh, condensate of this dna right right the, yeah the small structure so mm -hmm. actually all of them right so so i'm as it yeah hmm. ah like, okay but what okay uh the small you do, the spheres you you mean something similar to the um, hydrogel sphere you have oh well yeah so that's also one problem we had uh at first that we we didn't immediately see those before looking at the background uh because you know they actually look like a legitimate uh bead like a legitimate a bead, bead yeah thing, right yeah, the only thing is that if you look at the two images, there, there's no one here, right? There yeah, was no yeah, one yeah. here. Now there is, and mm, and that mm, mm. pops up. Um, mm, mm. So yeah, so it, it is a con, con is a, an aggregate, right? Yes, mm, mm, it, mm. It is pure D, well, assume this is pure DNA. Um, yeah, those ones. One idea I have, but it's hard to confirm, is that they might grow on like you know dust particles or something like this um so that's why you know there it's hard to say but yeah 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 even if it was the case um why aren't they here right like uh, so one thing we we're thinking is that yeah maybe this is just like a type 2 on the dust particle so that allows it to just keep growing but then you know we have type 2s in the other concentrations but not type 1 like yeah okay you know when you work with the microscopy it very much depends how many samples you look at yeah you know the, this can be just a, a stochastic <laughs> appearance of dust yeah. or any particle right. you know, i believe the most interesting are the type 2 and type 3 mm -hmm. because we expect that uh, you know they will uh, appear uh, more or less randomly uh, diffused mm -hmm. yeah yeah Okay, yeah. and the final question. So you are, um, you, you, do you do these experiments or, you know, all the people do the experiments so you analyze data? Um, so these experiments uh, I did in collaboration with uh, Guillaume, so this uh, second author, uh, and they were done at, in the lab at the uh, Tokyo University. Um, so I do not have uh, the material like the, the experimental material myself so yeah that's why i had to go to someone else's lab uh, to do this and then i analyzed the data um yeah so once people figured out what i was really trying to do uh i mean i, I was kind of open about it right like it's not like i was hiding uh, anything but yeah when they looked at the data and uh, like yeah uh yeah don't don't do that <laughs> so you know for the funny story okay um, no, no no but uh, it's interesting that you you spotted the uh strange behavior and then you investigate in quantitative way so yeah thank you uh, so, uh, that, you know that, i was like i was curious about it right it's like well what if we you know people tend to want to avoid this behavior but you know what if, if we actually look at them and have a greater understanding of it and i know it's you know uh as they have my co-authors and others have told me, you know, it's kind of dangerous. You can have contamination of your lab. Uh, but at the same time, because we're using something that is completely sealed and, and that we're never opening again, well, you know, it's not like you're going to have, well, you're not supposed to have contamination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. always good to do it in someone else's lab then. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, okay. Okay, very good. So yeah. it's uh, time is over. We thank very much uh, Nathaniel.